Hey guys, this is Toby Mathis. And Jeff Webb. Hopefully you guys can hear us all right. Maybe you guys can give it a little confirmation. First off, happy Halloween week, I think. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Gosh, it's coming up quick. This year's just flying by, first off, so. Oh, look at this. New screen, old screen. Yeah, we were having some fun stuff. Sometimes uh, we try to keep you guys on your toes by... Uh, coming in as different people and showing you guys stuff. All right. So hopefully you guys can see it now. Here we go. Loud and clear. Here you Happy Halloween. Lots of Halloween stuff. Good. Well, we're going to jump in. We got a lot to go on. I decided to bite off a big chunk. And uh, uh, so we have a lot of questions to go through. <laughs> you kicked us off first. What? <laughs> Um, uh, here we guys, uh, you didn't like us since we got disconnected. Oh, somebody got disconnected. All right. All right. So hopefully everybody's back in. Uh, I really like the provided list. Perfect. All right. Let's go through some stuff. First off, Jeff's going to have to wear his, look at that. You're like a little witch. Oh, I see that. Yeah. All right. Uh, you wear it well. Thanks. And there's a pumpkin. All right. So that's about as good as we're going to get into the, uh, uh, they call you just, this is not very nice. People are being mean to me already. All right, so let's go into it. Uh, first off, we're going to just <laughs> do, do a couple little reminders. Uh, we have, uh, obviously, our YouTube channel on our Facebook. F feel free to join whenever you feel like it. Uh, yes, yeah, Sherry is asking already. Um, yeah, we have a book coming out. Uh, the TaxWise book is going to be coming out, and I'm also going to be coming out with an Infinity Investing next, uh, probably by June. Uh, one thing at a time is I have to finish up all the changes on the tax code with tax wise. Um, concepts are always, I try to use things that are easy to follow that don't change because lo the Congress loves to change. It's some of the little rulings here and there, some of the rules. Uh, so I try to stick with things that are going to be consistent. Like you're not going to have to relearn over and over and over again, but, um, Obviously, Congress is Congress. They do some weird stuff sometimes. I have a feeling that we have some people that we kicked off when we had to change things out. So there's a few stragglers. So um, we'll go back in here. Okay, I already paid my two. Yeah, we'll, we'll get. We'll make sure that we get you guys all that fun stuff. Uh, let's kind of go over rules, and I'm going to change things up a little bit tonight um, because some of you guys are always yelling at me every event. I have somebody come up and just give me a lashing about not using the slides right. They say, you're as answering all these questions that aren't on the slides. And I'm always saying that's because we get live questions that I do not post. So I'm going to try using a screen that says, we're answering live questions now. So you're not wondering whether the slides are not advancing. Uh, it only took us 100 and some episodes to, to, to make that change. But hey, slow learners, right? Right. Um, you can always send in your questions via Tax Tuesday to Anderson Advisors. We are through the, uh, I think it's the 15th. We have most of the questions that you guys asked that we're grabbing that were longer ones. So we are about a, we're, we are about a two week leg. So some people come up and say, hey, I emailed you a question. I didn't hear it last time. And I'm like, well, there's a good chance that it's it, because we are going to reach out to you no matter what. But uh, when we're selecting questions to be answered, we have uh, been quite literally hundreds and we're going through them in the order received. And so we select which ones would be the best for the group, meaning that they're general. They're not, hey, here's my scenario. I make this much and this much and this much. Can I write this off? And da 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 da, da. So we try to use things that are more general. So that being said, uh, if you do submit something that is a very specific question for you, you're going to have to be a platinum client uh, or a tax client. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to go through and answer, you know, two hours of questions for you just, just because. Um, and then this is fast, fun, and educational. We want to make sure that you guys start getting the gist. I, I meet people all over the country. It's really fun. This, this week I spoke in, um, where did I go? We were in California and in, uh, in Nevada. We did a nice class in Nevada with a bunch of real estate investors, which was really fun. And I met a bunch of doctors down in, uh, in Los Angeles. It was just an investor group. Believe it or not, like these doctor groups are actually really cool. It's a bunch of doctors who figured out that real estate investing is very lucrative and you don't have to work 80 hours a week to do it. 
so it becomes attractive for a lot of those uh, a lot of those folks. Uh, but every time I, I go out and do these, you get people that have been listening to these for a while, and they've gone through a number of the Tax Tuesdays, and they're saying, "Hey, I can start answering the questions," and that's the whole point is that uh, you're able to start answering these things once you get the gist. And that gist just comes with time. And that's why we do it. It's a lot of fun. Let's go over the questions we're going to be answering tonight. Uh, speaking of so much fun, here's some opening questions. We're purchasing our first buy and hold property through an LLC. All the loan documents request are personal name, info, and signatures. Thought an LLC was to help with protection via anonymity of personal information. How does one sign for an LLC purchase? We'll answer that. How can I minimize taxes for someone with no kids uh, who under the new tax law can no longer itemize? So that's somebody who had their uh, miscellaneous itemized deductions go to the wayside. They don't have kids, so they don't qualify for a earned income. What is it? A child credit, right. earned income tax credit, and some other things. And so they're like, hey, what do I do? So we'll get into that. Uh, can you get lender financing for a property deposit from uh, from a self-directed IRA? So there's a couple ways to read that one. I've yep. read it like three or four times trying to figure out what exactly it was saying, but I think I got it. Are horses and their expenses tax deductible? Can a revocable living trust be the managing member of an LLC flowing through to a couple's tax return when there are two trustees? Uh, what do you need to do to use the Medical 105 plan and reimburse your medical expenses? What is the meaning of DBA and what are implications of setting up a business structure using DBA? Go over that. I recently sold a home and purchased another in the same year. I did not fill out any special tax paperwork. Will this qualify as a 1031 exchange? So this one came in, in a few different pieces and I actually kind of put it together, trying to I, reading the tea leaves of what they were asking. They said they didn't do any special paperwork and what would this be treated as and everything else. So we'll, we'll go over that, what that means when you don't go through a mediary or intermediary. Uh, is it better to form an LLC or corporation on rental properties? That's interesting. And some of you guys are already laughing because you know where I'm going to go with this immediately. <laughs> um, if I plan to purchase one or more vehicles with the intent of renting them out, should I title the vehicles in an LLC? So somebody's going to go out there and, probably leased to the Uber drivers. Should I turn my residence into a rental property, sell it after two years, and 1031 it to delay paying property gain, one million tax? We will definitely go over that. That's interesting too. Um, can I offset gains from rents with depreciation? We will answer that. These last ones I kind of like. They were short, but there's a lot. There's a large number, but they're not as big as some of the questions we sometimes get. Can I expense travel to a remote real estate investment owned by my qualified plan in order to supervise renovation? And uh, can a small newly set up LLC buy a property? So we'll go through all those. And uh, even when you think you guys know the answer, it's sometimes fun because uh, the answer is it's so interesting there's there's uh, different ways to read these and depending on how you read it it could have a pretty different result so we're going to go through these jeff this is going to be fun and scary and it's halloween well, scary all right um we already have a few questions that are coming in somebody says the audio is distorted so let's make sure it's not if anybody's having trouble with the audio let me know otherwise i have a feeling that uh, that uh, somebody's yes, it's, it's probably somebody's internet connection. So try try the phone, and the phone might might help you. And uh, yeah, so anyway, cool. We are purchasing our first buy and hold property through an LLC. Congratulations! All the loan documents request our personal name, info, and signatures. Thought an LLC was to help with protection via anonymity of personal information. How does one sign for an LLC purchase? Um, Jeff, well, this really isn't a tax question, but it's a very interesting question. Uh, when you go to the bank, somebody has to sign for the LLC. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the members, preferably the manager, can do it if you have a separate manager. Uh, one thing I was a little concerned with, though, was... Uh, make sure that they're not getting personal guarantees. 
They probably are. Like you, like, so anytime you have a business, there's three C's. You can actually write this down. This will be helpful to anybody doing this because you could explain this to your kids. If you have cash, collateral, or credibility, you're going to need one of those three C's, cash, collateral, or credibility. So like the reason people don't like to give young people um, loans is because they usually don't have any of those three. <laughs> Right. You know, they don't have a history yet. They certainly don't have enough cash. Uh, and I've done this with businesses, by the way, where I'll actually go get a CD and you pledge it as security on a line of credit on a business so that the business starts to get credibility. So it's not just me. Otherwise, they're always going to look at the owner. Um, so the collateral is the real estate. So that LLC has no credibility, so it's going to have to borrow somebody else's. And that's where the owner comes in. So almost always when you're financing property, your first bunch, probably your first 10 at a minimum, they're doing the direct financing with you. Once you have enough credibility and collateral, there has to be equity in those properties, then you'll start getting loans that do not have personal guarantees. And uh, frankly, you'll learn that you don't really care whether you have a personal guarantee or not on the property. That in and of itself is not an asset protection issue. Like, Maybe somebody, there's something that happens on that piece of property and they go pull the loan to see who signed on it. That loan document and that mortgage or the security against that property is going to say that you guaranteed it. That doesn't put you in the firing line. Being a guarantor on a loan does not make you liable to tenants on that property. That would still be the LLC. And, and something we see a lot, like in refinancing of these rental properties, mm -hmm. the banks want you to pull the property out of the LLC. Get it into the individual. Get it into the individual, mm -hmm. refinance it, and then you end up dumping it right back into the LLC. Yep, 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 yep. And uh, somebody just said this. I bought my first property under my personal name. How can I change the title now from mortgage company to LLC name? Well, you don't change it from the mortgage company. You're still on the hook. So... You're just transferring it into the LLC or more likely than not, if you have a loan and you're worried about that loan, you're going to use a land trust. Um, so and there's somebody else who asked the exact same question. If you convert a rental home from a personal ownership to owned by your solo member LLC, when they say solo, yeah, single member LLC, where, how do you make this change on the tax forms? You don't. This is the thing. An LLC is a creature of state law. So we always have to look at things and step back and unpack them. So from a tax standpoint, this is more than likely 99.9% .9 of the time completely neutral. And that's because you own the LLC and it's going right. to go on your schedule. E. The only question is whether or not you own that LLC straight up where it's a disregarded LLC. I mean, it exists for state law, gives you asset protection, but for the federal government and the state, they look at it and say, ignore that LLC and we'll look at the owner. So that's option number one. Option number two is if you and a spouse own it or you and another third party, you might say, hey, you know what? Make it a partnership. In which case, all you're doing is saying you file an informational return called a 1065 with the IRS that says, here's how much money it made. Here's the owner's. And that you get a K-1 and it goes on your same schedule E, just goes on page two instead of page one. The properties are not all listed on your 1040. They're just, there's a summary line. It's just the summary from that LLC. At the end of the day, it'll make zero difference. The only difference between those two things is I'll have a somewhat cleaner uh, 1040 if I do that partnership return. If it's no partnership return, then it's the same as me owning it personally. Now somebody's going to say, wait a second, I want an anonymous ownership. Well, the anonymous ownership is going to be completed either using a land trust where you use somebody else or a company, better yet, as the trustee. And then from a personal title standpoint, if somebody goes and searches who owns that property, they will not see your name. If they pull up that LLC, you can have anonymous ownership in LLC. They don't see your name. If you have it in the land trust and they say, who's the beneficiary other than in uh, Arizona, and there's a slight workaround even there, uh, other than Arizona, you do not list beneficiaries of land trust. So you're just saying, hey, the bank knows I'm the that I am on the hook and I am on the hook for that loan to that bank. 
but not to any other third parties. In other words, somebody trips and falls, they do not get to sue you simply because you guaranteed a loan or that you helped that company get a loan. I hope that makes sense. So, so in this particular case, if there was a land trust involved, mm -hmm. uh, would the trustee of the land trust actually be the person signing for the purchase? Uh, yeah, the trustee would be signing. So the, the way you look at and a land trust. would be the land trust itself? If you're buying directly through the land trust. Most people buy and they close in the land trust or the LLC, or they buy and they have financing. It's like this case. There's no way the, per the, uh, the lender is going to let you close in the name of the LLC. It's not going to happen. First time you do it, they're going to say, you need to close on this individually. And the reason being is they want to make sure that they have you on the hook. They want to make sure that, that, that you're, you're, you're going to be responsible. So they're going to make you close in your name. And then if you transfer it afterwards, they really don't care because you're still on the hook. Uh, do all states recognize land trust? Yes. There's about 15 states with actual statutes. The rest of them are common law. Uh, how do you become an anonymous owner of an LLC in California? So, Lana, I'll give you kind of a, a way to do it. It's a two-step. Number one, LLCs in California incur a $800 a year franchise tax. So I probably would use a land trust and have it held, have the beneficial interest held outside the state. But if I wanted to have an anonymous ownership directly in the state, I would create a Wyoming or Nevada entity that's anonymous, and I would have it be a member managed LLC in the state of California, which means the member is who's listed and that member is the out-of-state LLC. That's how you create anonymous ownership there. Um, somebody says, and here I should probably put my new screen up. This is a chance to do my new screen. Um, my wife and I are starting a new single member LLC tax as a disregarded entity. In the formation documents, is it necessary to list her as a member? If we do, have we moved away from a single member LLC and are now a partnership? So Kevin, the answer to that question is, are you in a community property state? Because if you're in a community property state, then you both can be listed. If you're not, then technically you're a partnership when you're both listed and you would then file a partnership. If you want to avoid filing as a partnership and you're in a separate property state, then you set up a living trust with the two of you guys as trustees and you guys are both beneficiaries, but then you have only one trustee own the LLC. That's a little tricky way to do it. And the courts are already, I mean, the IRS is already cool with that. Um, there's usually a way to do it. Uh, somebody says, uh, what's the workaround on an AZ trust? The AZ trust, the beneficiary is going to be listed, so it's going to have to be an LLC already there. That's anonymous. There you go, Chad. So there's always a way to get around it. There's always a way to get around it. Uh, for a brokerage account with a single member, LLC is the beneficiary. Uh, is a grantor who can best be the trustee. I see what you're saying, Maria. So this is a question. It's a little bit different. It's not right on real estate, but quite often when you are uh, having a brokerage account in an LLC, the brokerage company started wanting to charge LLCs as professional traders. They started trying to cha charge them like a couple hundred bucks a month. Uh, do you see more than that? Or you saw some of those, right? Uh, we brought, yes, we run into some with that exact thing. Yep. So what you do is you set up a personal property trust. We do this as a courtesy for our clients, by the way. Uh, personal property trust where the beneficiary is the LLC. It's the same as holding the account in the LLC. And you as the individual are the trustee. Then they're happy as a clam. And in that particular case, you should be the trustee because you want to be in control of the account. Uh, let's see. Can I change the name of my Florida LLC? Of course. You can always amend the name. You can amend your own personal name, too. Uh, somebody says with an LLC, isn't it different state to state? Um, yeah, all, all states have different statutes. A lot of them have the Uniform Limited Liability Company Act, but there's differences. So that's, for example, there's differences in Nevada and Wyoming. You cannot foreclose on an interest in, a, uh, in real estate, and that's going to be very different than, say, a state like uh, Washington or California. Um, somebody says... 
What else was another one? I want to make sure that I'm getting through this. Is this true of tax lien purchases? You buy a tax lien. If you're not financing, you don't have to worry about it. You can buy it directly. It's only when you have financing. Uh, somebody says, I'm transferring a rental property from my name to my new LLC. Can I record all incoming and expenses? So all income and expenses for the year to the LLC. Or do I need to have a partial year on a personal return and partial year on 1065? You would do the latter if that LLC is actually a partnership. You would record the partnership income, but it's going to, here's the, here's the funny part, Jason. It's all going to end up on your 1040 anyway. So it's going to make no difference in the end. Yep. So somebody says as a real estate agent, and then I'm going to advance this because we have a lot of the questions that were relevant. Now we're getting to some that are different. As a real estate agent, is there a benefit to getting paid through my entity as opposed to myself personally? And if yes, which would one use, an LLC or my C Corp? So Chris, as a real estate agent, your state is gonna have restrictions yes. on what kind of entity you can be as a professional in having a license. Your real estate board and your state are gonna have little restrictions. Usually it's an S Corp or an LLC taxed as an S Corp or disregarded. So. Remember that LLCs are creatures of state law. They're not a tax type. So we can have an LLC that's taxed as a C corp. We can have an LLC that's taxed as an S corp. We can have an LLC taxed as a partnership. We could tell the IRS to ignore the LLC. Um, you know, you can you can do it. At, uh, somebody says, I cannot see the writing of the questions. We already went over that. We are answering questions right now that are submitted via the chat. You guys can't see that because names are associated with these and I don't want you guys seeing your names with a question in case you say something that could get you in trouble. Um, and, and the other thing we see with the real estate agents is even if the state law allows them to put the income in a certain type of thing, mm -hmm. the broker won't always allow it. You got it. And what Jeff is saying is critical. So if you have, for example, I have my company, I set up an S Corp, and I am the real estate agent, and you're in a state, let's say Texas, Texas has some inconsistent rules. Some say you can do it, some say you can't. So brokers are gonna take the more conservative route and say, I can't pay your escort. And what you have to do in order to comply, there's actually a, a, a tax ruling on this, I think it was Friedman case, where it says you need to have an employment agreement between you, the agent and the escort, showing that it has dominion and control over you. And then you have to make your broker aware. And then it doesn't matter whether it pays it to you or not, you're gonna list it on that. S Corp and you will win under those circumstances. So um, some people just put it on a Schedule C and zero it out. They say, all right, I made 100,000 and then you have a $100,000 expense going to an S Corp. You could try that too, but I prefer to follow the what the IRS says. All right, so let's go to the next question. We managed to spend a lot of time on Question number one, let's go to question number two. And I do see that you guys are asking a lot of questions and we will get them. Um, we will go through a bunch of those. How can I minimize taxes for someone with no kids who under the new tax law can no longer itemize? Jeff, what do you feel about this? This has a big, it depends answer to it. Um, because it depends on where your income is coming from uh, whether you're just a W-2 employee or whether you have rental incomes or some kind of outsourced mate, outside uh, company that you may own, a corporation or a partnership. Uh, so there's various things you can do, whether it's retirement uh, contributions will lower your income. Uh, if it's uh, money coming from other entities, there are other ways to minimize some of that income. What say you? Well, so whenever you, me, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like this process person. I always trust the process. So if I have somebody who, and I don't care who you are, it just happens to be if you're single, no kids, maybe, maybe you're married with no kids, but uh, you can't, you don't have miscellaneous itemized deductions, so you have your standard deduction. That standard deduction is step number three in my world. So step number one is calculate all your different income types and how do you minimize your taxes is you keep that income from hitting your return. So if I have income coming from a business, um, I am probably, I'm gonna try to keep that from just jumping onto my return. If I have income coming from um, rental properties, then there's a way to start 
pushing that up into a management entity to keep it from hitting my return. If I have income from a business and it's all going on my Schedule C, then there's a way to keep that. I could put that in a C Corp, I could put that in an S Corp, and there's things I could do to keep that from hitting my return. Step number two is what are the, when you were looking at adjusted gross income, what are the areas of adjustment? So you're gonna be looking, like Jeff's saying, you're gonna be looking at IRAs, you're gonna be looking at HSAs, you're gonna be looking at anything that's gonna adjust your income. And then last but not least, we're gonna to get to where we have deductions. And you guys all have a standard, uh, you have a standard deduction. And the problem that is, is those standard deductions are really big now. So we have these huge standard deductions. Now, a lot of you guys aren't getting the benefit of your charitable giving. You're not getting the benefit of your, um, of your mortgage interest. You're not getting the benefit of your state and local taxes. You have a $10,000 limit. We saw a lot of people just get um, hammered on that. Yeah, that's, I mean, like really bad. We're talking about people with 60, 70, $80,000 of state and local taxes that they couldn't write off. And you're going to say, all right, how can I minimize taxes? Well, I'm going to get the money out some other way. So for example, and I'm sorry to give you guys a long answer, but uh, let's say that somebody is uh, has a home. I want the home office deduction. And I don't want a home office deduction as a sole proprietor. I want an administrative office in the home that their employer is reimbursing them. So the employer gets a deduction and they don't have to report the income. And I'm gonna write off somewhere around 15 to 25% of all of my expenses associated with my home, including my utilities and everything else. And I'm not gonna have to report it but I had to make sure that that never hit my return as income. So I need to have a business. I have to have an accountable plan to do that. That's why you hear me sometimes going off on accountable plans. You have to have an S or a C Corp from a tax standpoint. So yes, this could be an LLC tax as an S, LLC tax as a C Corp. You gotta have one. Otherwise you can't do that. Uh, last but not least, there are things that when we look at the deduction side, now I'm looking at things and I'm like, all right, maybe I can't deduct this, maybe I can, maybe I can get some real estate professional status and make a big deduction on the, of the depreciation. Maybe I can give, uh, maybe I'm going to really work my Schedule A and I'm going to give a whole bunch of money to a charity. Maybe it's my own charity. Like maybe, um, maybe I set up my own operating nonprofit that I can toss a bunch of money into. That'll reduce my taxes for sure. Uh, maybe I put a, maybe I'm looking at credits. Maybe I'm looking at solar credit. Maybe I put a, uh, hey, I get a 30% solar credit. Maybe I buy an electric car so I can get a credit. I'm looking at all these things and I'm going through like a mental checklist to figure out what is available to me and whether any of it falls into a category that I may want to take advantage. If I do that, then I don't care if you have kids. I don't care if you're married. I don't care. We're going to get your taxes lower, period. It's just how much of an appetite you have and how much of a benefit. So for a doctor in California, which you yeah, I got to meet with a whole bunch. They're pretty funny. Um, they have a tax appetite. They're, some of those guys are paying 53% tax. Before you say, that's impossible. No, it's not. You add up the payroll taxes, you add up the net investment income tax, the state income tax, and the federal tax, and they get up over there, and it stinks. And, uh, and it's, just not, it's just not right. So they have a tax appetite. So if I can get you know, a $20,000 deduction that they wouldn't otherwise get, that's a $10,000 savings to them. It's, it's really strong. Now, if, if it's 24 year old who's making $40,000 a year, they don't have much of a tax appetite. They're not going to want to do that. They're going to say, hey, wait a second. If I, why would I spend $2,000 to save myself a thousand? It's always going to be a value proposition. Um, so somebody says, how can I minimize taxes for someone with family gross income on a W-2 around 300,000? So VJ, you reduce that tax by, again, Credits, deductions. If there's an old adage that if you pay uh, if you pay taxes, it's you know a it's voluntary, but you pay taxes because you don't own enough real estate. That's the old joke, and the reason being is because I can take real estate and I can make it in. I can overcome the implication that is passive by either myself or a spouse being involved in real estate. To it was called real estate professional status. It doesn't actually exist under that name, under the code. It's actually just an exception for real estate, for uh, for real estate investments in which you materially participate. So it's if you like if you like code provision, it's 26 USC 469 C7. So if you like if you're nerdy, go there, read it. It gives you the exact rules. 
Now all of your real estate deductions, including depreciation, you can offset your $300,000 in, in income. So we could actually, you know, so VJ, we can eliminate your tax if we want to. Just buy enough real estate and make sure you qualify or your spouse qualifies as a real estate professional. If that's not your flavor, set up a charity and do your real estate investing through a charity. You're allowed to do that. Actually, low to moderate income housing or Section 8 qualifies as a nonprofit activity. Then if I give my charity $100,000 to buy a property, I get a $100,000 deduction right now. Yep, it's going to lower my three hundred thousand to two hundred thousand. I'm going to save, depending on your tax bracket, probably between twenty-two and thirty-seven thousand dollars for doing that. And I still own the property and everything else. So, how do we get there? I'm going off now. I need to draw myself back in and breathe a little bit. All right, minimizing taxes. All right, um, you guys are asking a lot of questions too. By the way, there's some good ones. But, yeah, a lot of what how you're going to minimize taxes is going to depend mm -hmm. on what type of income you have and what type of income you can commit to in the future. Uh, capital gains, we have opportunity uh, zones. We have uh, opportunity zones are great. Uh, yeah. Contributing appreciated assets to uh, charities. Mm -hmm. uh, we have selling off your losers to minimize your gains on, on uh, capital gains. So mm -hmm. there's a, uh, Every every item seems to have a number of ways to do this. There are so many cool questions right now. And the, so we're going to go one. So that based off of what you just said there, really quick, how do you keep your rental income going on to your income on your tax return? So now, now you're thinking, meaning you get a star because you're thinking, right, hey, this income is going to hit me. How do I keep it? Well, we offset it. There's a deduction called depreciation. Now, if you follow the IRS guidance, you just like, let's say I have a, a rental property that's that's. I'm going to assume it's residential. That's 27 and a half years. That's the that's the the Macers modified accelerated cost recovery system. It's this. That's the default. That default isn't what you're required to do. You can change that, and you could say, Hey, wait a second. Parts of this house aren't going to last 27 and a half years. It's going to last five years. The carpet's going to last five years. Paint's going to go away. The the doors aren't going to last 27 and a half years. The appliances aren't going to last. The Electrical system is going to last, you know, 15 years. Well, if it's less than 20 year time period, you can write it all off in year one. That's how you keep that income from hitting you is you accelerate the depreciation that negates the income. You still have the money, but you don't have to pay tax on it. That's how you do it. And it keeps you it keeps it from ever hitting your tax return. Uh, another one, Rory says, well, how, you know, how does this accountable plan work? Well, same situation. Let's say that I have uh, rental properties and I have uh, rentals income being made. What I would do is pay a corporation to be the manager, my own corporation, and then it would set up an accountable plan. And it would reimburse me for things that benefit it as the management company. It's my family management company. Now I'm going to get my cell phone, my equipment, my computer, a chunk of my house. I'm going to get all these things, miles and, and medical, dental and vision and all these things. And I'm going to write them off but I'm not going to have to report it as income. It doesn't go on my 1040. So we just eliminated a big chunk of tax. Does deduction apply to both free and clear as well as properties with leverage? Yes, it does, Kevin. Um, how do you keep your, oh, somebody says that already. I have W-2 rental properties. Is it recommended to open a property management firm under my wife and contribute to retirement for her? Usama, you get a star too. So Mina and Usama both get stars because they're starting to think Tax wise, hey, if I can get that property into a cor if I can get the money into a corporation, then I'm either going to get it out to myself tax free, or I'm going to let the corporation pay tax, or I'm going to pay it to somebody for services rendered, and I'm going to defer it into a retirement plan, and I'm not going to pay any taxes. How about them apples? I'll take that action all day long. Absolutely, you guys are nailing this. Um, Somebody says, okay, I lost my job mid-year. Now I want to go into, I went, went into rental real estate. Great idea because rental real estate pays you whether you want to work or not. What is the best approach for to prep for taxes? I have three units. Uh, what I want to do, Kevin, on that is you're going to want to um, calculate how much improvement, how much the improvements are on that property, how much income is coming in, and we're going to determine how much tax we want to pay. And you have a choice. By the way, I can I could choose to just write off five-year property, seven-year property, 
just 15 year property, take bonus depreciation, not take bonus depreciation. I have so much control in the accountants. For whatever reason, they always say 27 and a half years. And that is just, I mean, that's kind of lazy. That's all it is. What if I'm already enrolled in a 401k uh, from a job? Can I do beyond that amount? Well, your 401k, your deferral is for you only. But you can contribute to multiple 401ks and you can go up to the, what is it, 56,000 this year? Yeah, uh, so you can contribute, the, assuming you're under age 50. 19.5? Uh, 19.5 mm -hmm. total. But is that $56,000 limit is per employer. Per employer, per 401k, right. Per so, 401k. And that's based off of the 25% of your salary. Correct. So, yeah, you can actually contribute 100 plus thousand right. into 401ks. Your employers can do it for you. You can do your own. That's so cool. Uh, when do you need to create a resolution for an LLC and what types of situations? Okay, that's kind of a funky one. Any, any major decision you want to back up with writing. The way I tell people is if you fell off the face of the earth and somebody tried to figure out what you were doing, they would need to have a paper trail. You should be able to tell what that company was doing based on that paper trail. So if you weren't there to explain it, you just want to have a written explanation. That's all. Uh, and the way I always look at it is the amount of respect you show your business is the amount of respect banks, judges, and other third parties will show your business. So just keeping a, a paper trail uh, keeps you out of trouble. All right, there's a whole bunch. Uh, I do cost seg, then sell in one to two year items. We don't have to recapture, so there's just uh, so there's very little benefit. All right, you all right? Here's how it works: when I accelerate depreciation, and I sell even one or two years later, I've actually had cases. Like I could like it was in the uh, webinar we did about two months ago mm -hmm. with Eric Oliver. There was a great there was a great example where we did a cost segregation right before selling a multi-unit and it saved the taxpayer $70,000. And the reason being is this, when you depreciate under straight line, you have to recapture that at your ordinary income tax bracket capped at 25%. So if you're in the highest tax bracket, the most you're going to pay is, is 25%. When you do accelerated depreciation, then you are either paying ordinary income on the fair market value of that, that piece of property when you sell, or it's long-term capital gains. Long-term capital gains being capped at 20%, also being taxed commiserate. It could be either 0, 15, or 20%. So when somebody is doing this and you're just going to hold it for two years, it really depends on how old that property is. Yeah. So if I have five-year property, I've had the unit for three years, I do a cost segregation on five-year property, it has no value. That's going to be taxed as long-term capital gains, and I'm going to get an accelerated depreciation for that extra year mm -hmm. right now. That's like a tax, well, that's an interest-free loan. It's really hard for those things to not pencil out to be beneficial unless, you know, unless it's under 250000 but everything else, I've, I've yet to see situations where it wasn't a tax benefit, and then it just becomes, is the tax benefit worth the cost of doing the cost segregation? So if the cost segregation is 2000 bucks and it saves me six, some of you guys are going to say it's not worth it. If it's 2000 bucks and it saves me 60, then you're crazy not to do it. All right. Can you get lender financing for a property deposit from a self-directed IRA? Um, I read this as they were wanting to get the down payment from the lender. Me too. Uh, and if you're talking about from a bank, I would find that highly doubtful. Uh, they're going to want to see money from you or the entity or something. Uh, I can't see how you'd ever get your, your deposit out of an IRA. I don't think you can. I think you can get a, a distribution for new first homes and things like that like for a set amount, but otherwise the lender can't use your IRA as, um, you can't secure, as collateral. Yeah, you can't secure right. your loan with so, your IRA. So here's the trick. You can't borrow from an IRA, but you can borrow from a 401k. And you can borrow up to $50,000 over five years from a 401k, and you can do that per participant. So husband and wife, 
can borrow up to $100,000 from a self-directed 401k. So I would, if I see a self-directed IRA, I'm probably rolling that into a self-directed 401k or better yet, Anderson, we do one where you're the trustee. We don't, you don't even have a custodian, you're in complete control. Uh, you just want to make sure that you're giving or doing proper loan docs in case you were ever audited, but yeah, don't see that often either. But uh, then you could borrow. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I, if it's a rental property, I can see the IRA contributing to that mm -hmm. for a share. Yeah. Someone just said something really good, right? What about using a self-directed IRA or solo 401k to contribute to a syndication as a limited partner? You can absolutely do that. But here's the difference. If I have a self-directed IRA, you guys are going to learn way too much tonight. This is going to be freakish. Um, a self-directed IRA, if it uses leverage, you have to pay tax. It's called unrelated debt finance income. You have to pay tax on the income derived into the IRA from the from the leverage. So like if I if I buy into a syndication, chances are they're going to lever that my money. They're going to take a two million dollar investment and turn it into ten million by uh, by borrowing. Which means if that's the ratio, then for every dollar I put in, 80% of it's going to be taxable because I'm levering 80%. But that is not true of a 401k. A 401k does not have that same thing. So somebody else asked, hey, uh, if I want to invest in real estate, I believe possible, can I use my IRA? Um, I don't think I'd be using an IRA. I think I'd be, I'd be investing directly through a 401k. And as I needed money, I would take it out and I would pay the penalty and the tax on it. I'll be in a lower tax bracket if I don't have a job. Right. And that's this case. So I'm just paying 10%. I'm, I'm doing that. I'm taking that action. I'm going to leave it in my, my plan because you're going to, you can, you could really get those things cooking. I'd rather not have the penalty and everything else and then invest. I'd rather invest and then on the money I actually need, pay the little bit of penalty. Isn't that fun? Uh, you you can't borrow from your own self-directed IRA, but you can borrow from someone else's. And then you can loan their IRA from your self-directed IRA, Susan. Uh, no, that is a, uh, that is. Step transaction? Yeah, that's like textbook. You're learning quid pro quo in the news, right? You can't do that. Uh, you're benefiting from your plan document. The IRS is going to tax you. So don't do that. Um, that's really bad. And, and what IRS looks at when they look at these step transactions and quid pro quos is they break, they disregard all the different steps and say what actually happened. Yeah, yeah, you both took money out of your accounts. So that's really, really bad. This is why we do not show your names when you're asking <laughs> questions, in case you do it. Uh, what is, uh, what about a 401k that is rolled over to an IRA upon leaving an employer? You can still roll that into another 401k. But that 401k, you roll it into an IRA, and if it's self-directed, you can do it. What if a self-directed IRA holds a trust that holds a property? Can you get lender financing that way through the trust? Uh, will it still be subject to the special self-directed IRA tax? The answer is yes, because it's all going to go on to that, that, that self-directed IRA, and it would have the unrelated debt finance income. So, hey, it's Amanda. So, Amanda, you would, uh, you would roll that into a 401k, and you would do the financing instead of doing a self-directed IRA, you're just doing a solo 401k. You don't even have to contribute to the 401k. That's right. what a lot of people think. It's like you just roll your IRA directly into it, and now you don't have to worry. You, you can get all the financing you want. And there are companies that specialize in finance. Uh, boy, we have really been bad. Uh, I can be the, the trustee of a self-directed 401k and can set one up myself. Is this correct? Katrina, you can set one up, but you have to use a prototype plan. Um, I know, Amanda, see, you thought it was anonymous. I can see your name, but that's why I don't post it, everybody else. Uh, somebody says, I heard it's not possible. Yes, it is. Uh, we see we have people doing it all the time. We have thousands of folks that have set up, uh, I think we last last check, I think we had a 5,500 exempt organizations, and a lot of them doing real estate. So uh, don't let somebody tell you you can't. In fact, it was this weekend. And uh, the, again, it's the same. It was a group, a fun group of doctors, and one of them was was up on a panel, and uh, he was talking about uh, when he first got into real estate. 
he got one of those books off of late night TV that said how to buy real estate uh, with no money down. And he said, hey, I did this uh, I did this thing where I get, did the uh, no money down. And then about a month later, he bought a book that said it's impossible to do no money down. Well, he had bought an apartment complex in the, in, in the meantime for no money down. And he goes, it's a good thing I didn't order the second book. <laughs> Told me I couldn't do it. I just did. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, don't do that. Can you roll a 403B from a former employer to a self-directed 401K? Yes. Um, and again, you could do a self-directed IRA. It's just so much, uh, me personally, 401Ks are the way to go. You have so much more control. You have, you, you can actually invest in many different things and you don't have unrelated debt finance income. It's just way better. Um, let's see the next one. We've got some more questions, but they're not necessarily related. So we're going to keep jumping through. Bad Toby. Here we go. Are horses and their expenses tax deductible? Yes, they are. Um, as a matter of fact, some horses are even depreciable. Uh, you can depreciate breeding horses. You can depreciate race horses. Uh, for race horses, it's once they reach two years of mm -hmm. age. Um, there are some really cool. Uh, there are some really cool cases on horses, by the way. Yeah. Uh, we see a lot of those in Kentucky, so. Yeah, <laughs> that's where Jeff is from. Um, no, but there's some great tax court cases. There was one gal, a uh, dentist, who was making on average about $100,000 a year and her expenses on her horses about fifty. She won audit, there was three audits, and she won audit number one because um, of what, as to whether it was active or passive because she materially participated. Then they audited her again saying it was a hobby uh, about five years later. And by this time, she was just racking up massive losses. She lost money every year. So that's section 183. And they apply this nine-part test, which is, number one is, do you have a true and real profit motive? And they went through this big analysis. The gal's daughter was a CPA, and they tried to run through this. Well, she did everything herself. She had a one-page business plan that was a, a form that was halfway written out. And they looked at all the expenses and realized that about – 1% of it total was for re generating revenue. The rest of it was just caring for the horses. You have to make, and then there's other cases where, of course, they ride off everything. What was the funny one? The guy from Herbs and Rye. I have to tell, uh, no, Peaches and Herbs. Oh. Reunited and it feels so good. What's that guy's name? Barker? I Cecil remember. Barker. Yeah, Cecil Barker. Yeah, Beverly will love this. I have a uh, Beverly. Where's my little thing? There's something over there. Um, there's because she loved she loves that stuff and they also did uh georgia there was something georgia gladys knight and the pips won a grammy with with cecil barker's this is so completely out there but anyway he lost 38 million dollars over a period of 11 years trying to get his son into uh into into entertainment he tried to start a label and he won he won because he showed he had a profit motive and that's the most important thing that, well, yes, we say, yes, you can deduct these expenses. That's assuming, and that's why we talk about race horses and breeding horses, is that is the profit motive yep. itself. You just got to show you're trying to make money. You got to always show that you're trying to make money. There and you're all, we're also seeing them in some other fields like physical therapy where they're buying horses and all that actually help with the, uh, what their, some of their patients uh Muscleology needs. They're doing it with with, with uh, people that have uh, um, when you Alcoholics Anonymous. When you have an, oh really? Uh, yeah, when you have well, and drugs and all this stuff. When you have an addiction, they use equine. But there's all sorts of good stuff. So I just thought that uh, this was so interesting because there's so many funky cases. And the poor gal that got audited three times. She was she was going to tax court when they did the third audit. So it was like Jiminy Christmas. Uh, Sherry, I'm sorry to hear somebody said that there was a horrible tra tragedy in Atlanta with some horses, 13 or 19 show horses. Oh, uh, gosh, that is horrible, you know. Oy, oy, oy. Prayers go to those folks and those poor animals. All right, uh, jumping through, I'm not going to answer a bunch more questions. Can a revocable living trust be the managing member of an LLC flowing through to a couple's tax return when there are two trustees? This seems like I'm having deja vu. Did we already answer this? No, kind of, sort of. But the answer to this one is yes, that you can always do this. Yeah. Uh, I think every state would allow this. 
every state allows this, but even more importantly, when it flows to the couple's tax return, when there's two trustees, if you're in a community property state, you don't even have to do a separate tax return for that LLC. Now, here's my question for you. Uh, if a revocable living trust is the managing member of an LLC, and that living trust has a lot of other assets in it, is there an asset protection issue? We repeat the question, Jeff. Okay, so the, it's the managing partner of this LLC. So there's a managing member. Usually we don't like to see managing members, by the way. 90% of them or so are going to be manager managed, but go ahead. So if it's a managing member and the LLC is sued for something mm -hmm. particular, and this revocable living trust has a lot of assets. In it. Yep, you're going to say, should you have a holding company in between it? Okay. Yeah, and the answer is. There's always good, better, best. Good is at least have an LLC. Better is to have a, a, a um, holding entity that holds the LLC, so it's keeping you twice removed. And best is have that holding LLC in a state that you can't take away and it has anonymous ownership. So if you're going to do this with a living trust and it's just holding cash, a non-risk asset, something that's not going to get you sued, then go ahead and have that LLC right there. We don't really care. Um, personally, I would rather have that LLC in a state where nobody can see it, nobody can take it, if it has cash. But you know that's not going to be a huge liability. If it's a property, you just the last thing I'd want is to have to defend myself for outside liability and defend the LLC for inside liability in the same state in front of the same court. I actually want to make that extraordinarily complicated and involve two jurisdictions to make it cost prohibitive for anybody to really try to do it. And so they always like the old adage is for 250,000, you could break through most plans. For the most part, I can make your life miserable if I decide to spend $250,000 and sue, sue you to, to pieces. The trick is never putting yourself where that's ever worthwhile and, you know, making it so where nobody ever really sees that you have anything to justify the 250,000. Doesn't mean you're going to lose, by the way. It just means that somebody can make your life, uh, you know, pretty miserable. If they decide that they're going to, they're just going to target you. Right. You don't have to lose a lawsuit for it to be no. expensive. You can win. We just had a great client, you know, client had a uh, tenant destroy the downstairs of his, what was going to be his dream house. They flooded it out. And uh, in exchange for flooding it out, they sued him for mold and uh, tore up his house. And he sued him because it was them that caused the problem. They flooded the downstairs. Their kids did or somebody did. We don't know to this day. And uh, he won at trial, two year trial, 200 some thousand dollars. And they went bankrupt the following month to not pay the, the judgment. So what he got out of it was he spent about 200 some odd thousand dollars plus all the time and everything else to get nothing. Yeah. So it's not, it's not worth it. And it was just somebody just trying to shake him down. So I like kudos for fighting it. No kudos for the fact that you can't get it. You're better off just having it in an LLC where you're like, this is the max that I'm ever going to lose. Right. Yeah, so we keep it. Up. All right, thinking about liquidating. Um, here's somebody. I'm going to answer a couple questions. Uh, thinking about liquidating a previous rollover traditional IRA to fund a short-term rental in Orlando. I'm under 59 and a half. Is there a strategy to avoid recognizing the amount as income? I already know I am out 10%. You're going to have income if you take that out unless you fall under a category of a hardship. Uh, even with the hardship, I think that's just going to get rid of the penalty. Yeah. You can avoid the penalty if you do a 72T election, which is taking out equal distributions. I think you have to be 55. And, and even the hardships are very specific um, as to what is allowable. Although I hear mm -hmm. it's changing in 2020. Um, They're changing some of the hardships. Yeah, there are some other ways to do it. Um, but you, but the better thing is just to roll it into a 401k and then, um, and then invest through the 401k, and then if you need money, borrow it. And if and, and if and if you need money and you can't afford to pay it back, then pay the tax only on that portion of the money. Which which you can do that through a 401k. You cannot do that through an IRA. IRA it's either good or bad. When you take a distribution out of the 401k, the the portions that if you choose not to pay it back, there's portions that you could have as tax. And, and here's one of my issues. I've seen this often with people in financial straits, uh -huh. owe money to lenders, creditors, and so forth. Most times retirement money is protected from those lenders. They can't touch it. Yeah, we call it OJ money. 
OJ has a over, I think it's over 60 million right now that he owes the Goldman's and they still can't touch his uh, pension or the distributions there from. Uh, as soon as you pull it out, that's free money. No, only the, only the IRA, you pull it out, then it's free money. But even in a pension, the distributions are protected. So that's why OJ, he, he has to stay in Clark County right now. He lives in Summerlin. Yeah, because he's on parole. So he has to live out here. He still has his unlimited homestead in Florida. And he's still getting his distributions out of the NFL players. So like even with that huge judgment, they, they can't do anything. There's just nothing they can get. All right. Somebody says, hey, a husband and his two sisters, they're doing an investment in LLC. Husband has a Wyoming LLC, but the sisters don't. How do we complete the anonymity? You don't have to worry about it, uh, Lisa, because the anonymity is through the Wyoming, the the one with the sister, that LLC, is chances are the sisters are going to be listed. There's no anonymity. If you wanted anonymity for the whole thing, you would have to put it in a state where there's anonymity, which is really going to be Nevada and uh, Wyoming. Keep in mind that right now we have, uh, what is it, the House that passed a resolution for transparency. They're trying to get to all the owners of all the companies because they, they don't like not knowing who owns what. And uh, I think the Senate will knock it down. But just know every year we, we go through the same thing where they're always trying to figure out who are the owners of things. And they're always going to come up with some cockamamie idea that it's a bunch of terrorists laundering money, which is absolutely not the case. If you guys knew how money laundering goes, <laughs> I hate to even say that I know how some of this stuff works. They're not using that. Right. Um, there's lots of other ways to launder money without uh, without doing it. Yeah. Somebody says that. Uh, yeah, we won't go there. Uh, hey, if, if you do a 401k, if you need a 401k, Anderson does it. And if you need help on taxes, you can certainly contact us as well. That's not the reason I do these uh, webinars, though. Just know that we're just trying to get the information, but a bunch of people keep asking. I think tonight's been a little more active than normal. Usually I don't get to go off this much, but... Sorry, I think we're like three three questions in, right? Uh, do the horse horse questions pertain to livestock, dogs, etc.? Et yes, the uh, horses are special under the hobby loss rules. They have to make money five out of seven years. In fact, they look at horses because they're so expensive, and they think you're going to try to make horses into a your hobby into a deductible event. But it's much easier with with other livestock. Uh, Somebody says, Jeff, you are so smart. How could you do my taxes? You can always reach out. Uh, if a friend uh, contribute to your investments with a percentage, how can I set this up properly for the tax? Uh, Kevin, that's, uh, that's a good question. Uh, but what you want to do is figure out what type of entity it's going to be. And, and usually it's going to be a partnership. And then the question is who wants the, uh, the short-term losses and things like that. Uh, and guys, I'm sorry, if, I, if you answer, asked a question and we were getting hit really fast with a whole bunch and I didn't answer it, I apologize. Um, you may have to resubmit it just because I'm about, I don't even know, we're, we're hundreds of questions in off of the chat. We just got slammed tonight. And so if, it's, if, it's, if it was an hour ago, there's a good chance that it's so far back there, I'm not going to see it. Uh, what do you need to do to use the Medical 105 plan and reimburse your medical expenses? You can hit well, this one. first off, you need a corporation. That's the only place a 105 plan actually works. Uh, you need a plan document. Uh, it's usually what a one-page document. Mm. Say I'm establishing a 105 medical reimburse or health reimbursement account, um, and then you have to show your receipts to the 105 plan, the sponsor of that plan, mm -hmm. and they reimburse you. Yep, and a 105 plan is really just fancy way of saying a medical reimbursement plan. And if you're a 2% uh, or greater shareholder of an S-Corp or a partner in a partnership or, or we'll start with the 2% or greater shareholder in S-Corp, you have to recognize anything it gives you as taxable income. Right. And then you would write off the insurance premium only on your 1040. There's a self-employed reimbursement form. You're not going to get a benefit under a 105 plan if you are a sole proprietorship or a partnership as the proprietor or as the partner. If your spouse is an employee of the organization, then they could be covered under it. Right. That's, that's true. It's so much easier. The last entity, which we didn't talk about, was the C-Corp. So much easier to use a C-Corp for these. You don't, um, then you don't have to recognize any of it. If it's a C-Corp and it's just you, husband and wife, small company, then it's so much easier. And, and keep in mind that if you have full-time employees, that they are also part of this 105 plan. Yep. 
somebody says, can you do a 105 plan with an LLC tax as a corp? Absolutely. It's treated as a corporation for the IRS. So the 105 plan is no different than having a uh, the 105 through a regular C corp. Uh, can I reimburse medical expenses from my LLC taxes as a C corp, which go above the income earned for the year? Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing that even says that you have to take a salary or anything. That's actually part of the uh, compensation facts. If you ever go and you look at forms of compensation, you can look at uh, 26 USC 61. You're going to see all the different types of income. They have everything listed there. If you get a if you get a fringe benefit, it's compensation. So if I give you a like if I hire you and a, and I pay you in Ferraris, I have to do withholding on the for, on the value of the Ferrari. But I could give you if I give you fringe benefits. So all I give you is uh, you know let's say it's uh, vouchers for what's a good one. Give you vouchers for eating and oh, and, and maybe plane me. vouchers or whatever. I give you. Uh, how about I just yeah we just that's compensation. Or if I give you a car allowance, that's compensation. If I reimburse your car, not compensation. If it's business use. If I reimburse you for medical, dental, and vision, not compensation. If it's C corp and you follow the rules. So uh, allowance is kind of a dirty word. It's going to cost somebody money. Yeah. Somebody says, is a 105 plan uh, vouchers for Krispy Kremes? You are right on. You must have been to an event. Love them Krispy Kremes. All right, 105 plan is only for C-Corp. S-Corp is not allowed, correct? No, you can have a 105 plan in an S-Corp, but when it pays you as a greater than 2% shareholder or your spouse who is imputed because they're married to you as a 2%, that is wages. I don't think it's subject to... Um, Employee, it's not subject to employment no. taxes, though, right? It's not subject to the old age, death, and survivors of Medicare. Right. The only time I've seen the uh, 105 plans in the S corporations is if they did have employees, uh, unrelated employees, uh, and those 105 plans usually had limits set upon how much they were willing to reimburse. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody just asked a really good question. Oh, this is freakish. I'm gonna have to ask this. All right, can I do a partial in-kind distribution of a rental property? that's held in an IRA LLC without getting into a prohibited transaction because now the IRA and I own the property, assuming that I'm over 60 years old. I want to say no. <laughs> yeah, actually, you can. Can you? Yeah, you just can't enter into repeated transactions with it. It's weird, but you can do it. I believe, I've never seen anybody actually want to do it. Usually, they're going to try to find a taxable amount and they're going to try to come up with the cash. So, it gets kind of funky. Uh, what about reimbursements for medical problems from the Krispy Kremes? You can write those off too. Uh, and, and it's usually the same expenses that can be deducted uh, for medical on your Schedule A. Mm -hmm. uh, like over-the-counter drugs are not. That was such a good question, by the way. <laughs> Is there an advantage to having a corporation as opposed to an LLC tax as a C-Corp? Mina, there's one advantage. There's only one difference that I'm aware of. Um, I can tell you that the LLC usually gives you better protection than the corporation shares. The only state that has statutory protections for shareholders is Nevada. There's no other state that does it. It's normally what you're going to do is have an LLC taxed as a C-Corp. The biggest difference between an LLC taxed as a C-Corp and a vanilla C-Corp is what's called a 1244 stock loss. When it says stock loss, they don't say that means membership interest in an LLC. And all that is is if I have losses in a C Corp up to, let's say, let's say I lose $30,000, I have lots of expenses and I don't make any money and I get tired of running that C Corp, I can dissolve it and I can take that $30,000 loss in the C Corp and write it off against my active ordinary income, my W-2 income. Uh, I can do that up to $50,000 per shareholder. So a husband and wife could write off hundred grand. I can't do that with an LLC taxed as a C Corp. If you did this LLC tax as a C Corp and you did that same transaction, you'd have a capital loss of 30,000, right. which could or could not be offset capital gains, but it will not be, you'll, you'll be able to write off $3,000 per year against your W-2. You just carry it forward. So that's the difference. Um, <laughs> it is possible, uh, or you just sell the property inside the LLC. So Jorge, when you're asking about the, uh, in-kind distribution, it is possible. I don't, uh, in fact, you can actually partner and buy with your IRA and buy property. That's not a prohibited transaction. Right. It's the continued transactions between you and that property that 
become the issue. So but what if I already own the property? Then I don't see how it's a prohibited transaction. In fact, you can, as long as. Can I sell part of my interest to my IRA? I've seen people do that. Okay. I'm not sitting here today. I don't know if I could answer that question. Just, I'm just, just trying to put you on the spot. No, I'm just, I'm sitting here thinking about it because I know that you can, if I am buying that interest from my IRA, like, I don't believe that I could just enter into a transaction where I buy it. I think that I'm going to have to use it. I mean, some third party is going to have to acquire it. Okay. But I think I can turn it into cash, and I th or I think I could possibly swap it out for something of equal or uh, of equal value. But I just know that you're just just being an owner. You're you're both you're you're an owner. Usually, what you're going to do is set up an LLC, and you're going to distribute. And you're going to pay tax on a portion of it. On those distributions, being a partner with your own uh, IRA or 401k is not a prohibited transaction. In fact, there's a whole thing called a Rob's transaction that you do where you can actually partner and use the money from your 401k or IRA to buy um, to buy a business. A lot of people use it for franchises. Uh, buying and holding a 10plex with a non-spouse partner in Ohio, both residents of California, best way to structure, where to form the entities. Uh, Kush, what I'd probably do is have a Wyoming entity uh, just to keep you from having California seeing you. You're still going to see your K-1. You're still going to pay tax. And then any of the properties that it owns, uh, I would I would have an in-state entity. So like I would have an Ohio entity own the 10plex uh, and the owner of that Ohio entity will be the Wyoming entity owned between you and your partner. And then you could do that over and over again. Um, uh, somebody says you can pay your accountants with Krispy Kremes. Heck yeah. They're just like cash here. All right, let's keep going on. What is the meaning of DBA and what are the implications of setting up a business structure using a DBA? DBA means doing business as, uh, in some places, I know Los Angeles County, they call it a fictitious name. Yep. Um, I like the idea of DBAs. They're not foolproof, but they, I, I kind of feel like they add a little more anonymity too. Um, yeah. So if I go to Chuck E. Cheese's, that's not who actually owns that place. Right. Chuck E. Cheese's would be, yeah. Jeff Webb Franchise or Jeff Webb LLC. How about Anderson DBA. Business Advisors? I don't know if anybody ever noticed. There's nothing behind that name. Yeah. Anderson Business Advisor is a DBA of... Anderson Law Group PLLC. Correct. So all a DBA is, is it's a registration, usually in the county or city or state. Everybody's different. Like Wyoming, it's the state, and it's called a fictitious name. I think that you have a fictitious name statement in Texas. Um, there's You could do the uh, Clark County, for example, in, in, in Nevada. We don't have a state registration. You have it per county. Then, uh, or Washington State is a statewide. Mm. But you just say... I'm doing business as Jeff's Donuts. Right. And it's ABC Inc. doing business as Jeff Webb's Donuts. The DBA is just a database saying, hey, here's a business name. You cannot put LLC after it. You cannot put Inc. after it. You cannot put anything else. Now you're just saying, hey, um, I, need to, I need to look to see who the actual owner is. And so it's not uncommon for a corporation to have multiple DBAs and be doing business as different organizations. Absolutely. Yeah. And the implications, it's nothing more than a name. It's just pointing to some other entity. It has no tax ramifications. A lot of people will use a DBA for a sole proprietorship. It's like Jeff Webb doing business as Jeff Webb's Donuts. There's, you know, there's no asset protection under that. There's no tax. Like you're going to be a sole proprietor. You're going to be a Schedule C. It's... And for example, I have a company that, is a really boring name and it doesn't explain what I do. Yeah. But I could call it DBA Taxes R Us. Yeah. So you could have a really boring, anonymous named company. Hint, hint. And then wherever you're, if you're going to go do business in a state, you say, I'm doing business as Jeff Webb's Taxorama. And hey, if I'm going to go into Texas, I'm going to be. You know, redneck Texas or uh, Texas. It's mm -hmm. just because I go to the redneck, redneck country Texas, club. Like that. Yeah, well, that sounds horrible. Doing business as anonymous, somebody says. Um, no, I used to go to the redneck country club, so I'm not calling people in Texas rednecks before I get hate mail. Um, but you just, you know, something cool, Longhorn Texas. And then if you're in, 
uh, I'm from Philly, you know, <laughs> flying high taxes, uh, fly eagles fly. All right. So keep going on. Uh, we had we just, a whole bunch of fun stuff. How far are we in? I recently sold a home and purchased another in the same year. I did not fill out any special tax paperwork. Will this qualify as a 1031 exchange? I'm thinking this is going to be a fail from the start. Um, you probably sold the home, received the cash, uh, and then purchased another home. And the problem with that is you can't touch the cash. The qualified intermediary has to touch it. Yes, yeah, it's going to be a fail. Uh, the other problem is that you have to, within 45 days of selling the first home, you have to identify what you may be buying. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah this is not going to work you, you you can't do a 1031 as an afterthought yeah but here's the thing is if you sold a home and it was your personal residence we could still 121 it if you yeah, sold the home and uh yeah there, there's another one that's gonna be fun too i love it when they do the 121 and the 1031 exchange together but this this house so i purchased another in the same year sold it purchased another you may be able to qualify to opportunity zone that if you did it this year oh yeah uh, so you may still be able to do it, but the 1031 exchange, you can't touch the money. You have to have an intermediary in there from the, from the, uh, 121 is the, um, somebody's asking that 121 is the home exclusion for capital gains on your property that you lived into in the last five years. Um, redneck country club in Houston. Yeah. Do you know what it's called now? Uh, they changed the name. I think it's Republic. Um, shoot. I think it's something Republic. Anyway, the Redneck Country Club is really cool. They, uh, who is it? Jet Lending. They do free beer and food every every month. Um, good group, by the way. I love those guys. Eddie Gant over there at uh, Jet Lending's good dude. All right, uh, let's see. Keep going. Is it better to form an LLC or a corporation on rental properties? Now you know what I'm going to do, right? Yeah, go ahead and say it. An LLC can be taxed as a corporation. An LLC is not actually a tax designation. An LLC can be a partnership, a disregarded entity, S Corp, C Corp, trust, whatever you want it to be. So is it better to form an LLC or a corporation? Well, you don't really want to have a corporation for rental properties, period. Yeah, I was going to say that would be my last choice. Yep. So I'm going to make it real simple. You want rental properties to flow onto your personal return. You do not want them going into corporation. And the reason being, corporations just have income. But they have a little problem, and that is if they give a shareholder an appreciated asset like a rental property and you take it out to refinance it or do anything else, that is taxed. All the appreciation, whether you sell it or not, is taxed as wages yep. the day that it gives you that property. Yeah, Republic Country Club and Barbecue. There you go. You guys rock. Texans are pretty darn cool. Uh, all right, we got to keep rolling on because I'm way late. We're only, well, we're not so horrible. We're not terrible. Yep. If I plan to purchase one or more vehicles with the intent of renting them out, should I title the vehicles in an LLC? So you're probably renting them to a, like Uber drivers or things like that. So two things on this is, yeah, I think that they definitely should be put in an LLC because there's a lot of liability without renting out vehicles. Um, the other thing is, they need to be titled to the entity or person who is actually doing the renting. Mm, so is like, different well, so you, are you saying that, let's say I put them in ABC LLC and I rent them to drivers. It needs to be titled in ABC LLC. Yes. The drivers, it's not going to be titled in the driver's name. No, correct. Right. So yeah. And uh, I a hundred percent agree with you. The way that they do these is I've had clients do this. They buy a bunch of, uh, Priuses or Corollas. There's there's a few different vehicles. Some of the uh, um, there's a few vehicles that are in the thirteen, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollar range that 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 don't cost much to operate. That they like to rent to the Uber drivers on a weekly basis, Lyft drivers and things like that. You'd put them in an LLC to to keep them from flowing over to you. Because as Jeff said, uh, when you are the lessor, usually you're not going to get too drawn up into the in, into drama. You're just exposed to the loss of the vehicle. The driver is who's going to be responsible, but they could try to say that you uh, were negligent in leasing the vehicle to a driver. The other thing you do is you make sure that you have commercial insurance. A lot of folks just go get 
regular insurance on a car, then they use it in commerce. They'll, they'll put it in a company name or something, and they don't realize that that's a different type of insurance policy. That that's a commercial policy. And one other thing I would suggest is immaculate maintenance records on your vehicles. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. This is lucrative, though. I used to. This is something I did in college. I used to work for Alamo Rent a Car when they first got going, and uh, boy, they took off. They made a ton of money because they weren't tied to any car places, and some people would just give them cars. And say, hey, wow. we'll pay you to put. 10,000 miles on this one so that would, so that the new market was uh, wasn't as saturated. It's pretty interesting. Uh, management company is protected better as a C or, or as a corporation or an LLC. Um, protection wise, you're almost always going to be better as an LLC, but it can be taxed as a corporation. Um, let's keep going on. We're getting close. I know we're over, guys, but we're having fun. Should I turn my residence into a rental property, sell it after two years, and 1031 it to delay paying property gain, one million in tax? So you have a million dollars. Um, the answer is yes, and that is a great strategy. That's what I thought. Jeff, do you want to lay it out for him? So to, to get that one, Section 121 exclusion, the 250 or $500,000, you have to have lived in it for at least two of the last five years. Right. That doesn't mean you couldn't have rented it out for the last 35 months yeah. um, and moved somewhere else. Yep. So then after that time passes, it looks like two years they lived in it, and then maybe, or maybe three years they lived in it and rented it out for two years, and then they decide to sell it. They're first going to take that 121 exclusion of, say, $500,000, of a gain. Yep. It's a capital uh, gains exclusion. So guys, this is not depreciation recapture exclusion. This is just capital gains on the sale of a personal residence, property that was used as your personal residence two of the last five years. Right. It's got to be your main home. If you have a second home, it does not qualify. You could actually have two homes and then you qualify two and then for one right. for two years and the other for two years. You got to, you got to specify which one's your primary. But with the remainder of the gain, that remaining gain, say it's another half million dollars a gain, mm -hmm. can be deferred by selling this house through a 1031 exchange. Yep, and the IRS is the one who actually spells this out. You use It jumps your basis in the property, because if you guys know 1031 exchanges, you know I'm just swapping my property A for property or properties, B, C, D, E, F. Like you could just have a ton of properties, but the new properties inherit your basis. So everything about property one is, is transplanted under property two. When you do this and you have a, uh, and you have both a 121 and a 1031, your 121 jumps up the basis to whatever, you know, if it's married couple, it's 500,000. And then you 1031 the remaining portion Mm -hmm. um, when you do the rental property, you just have to you have to be very careful because you want to make sure that you're just specifying that the depreciation recapture is all going to the 1031. So um, if you have a million in tax of gain, excuse me, one million in gain, then we'd look at it and say, all right, uh, whatever that property, let's say it was a half a million dollars, and you're going to sell it for 1.5. The way it would look was you'd have a sale, 1.5 million. You'd have the basis step up for the half million dollars, the 500,121. So your new basis in the new property would actually be a million and you're deferring half a million dollars again. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, and I'd forgotten about that, about that. The 121 does step up your basis. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, again, we, when we do these things, you're spelling, like you're, you're following, like here's the IRS guidance. It's pretty straightforward. Just, it's just knowing it exists. Most accountants don't, you know, most people don't. It's not a slight on them. They just don't. It's like you don't know what you don't know. And if you've never heard of this, you're never going to know it. Yeah, yet. I knew it. I just didn't remember yeah. it. Yeah, that's it. There's always a little specific. Uh, does the house require two steps to the sale? No, John. You could actually do this. This is what's funny. Uh, guess what? You could make that 131 into an investment property, rent it for a few months, and then go move into it. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about that. Yeah, and I think that the rule is that you can't do another 121 on that property for five years if it was part of a 1031 exchange. You can actually go read 26 USC 121, and you're going to see it has specific language saying 
what's the property used as a part of a 1031 exchange in the last five years. They're letting you know right there, hey, it's okay. We know that you're going to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, if you live in Manhattan, San Francisco, certain really expensive places, Hawaii, uh, yeah, it gets really to be, it gets really annoying. So it's like, hey, so it's kind of fun. And you know, while we call it like kind exchange, it doesn't mean you have to sell a rental property for another rental property. You could buy land, you could buy a commercial property. Yeah. I mean, it's you, almost any kind of real estate that's so widely. A lot defined. of people are doing what's funny is they're, they're selling all their uh, single families and putting them into uh, storage units because they can't stand their tenants. And that's why property managers exist. But yeah, that's actually not too bad either. Some people are just getting annoyed because um, the millennials all not I, we love them we love the millennials but they're they're sometimes they're try it can be it can be frustrating when you're when they're your tenants right um this is pretty funny uh all the consultants at anderson as smart as uh, you guys way smarter <laughs> we're the idiots doing the free work on a webinar. We're actually wearing earphones. And yeah. That's what we should answer, Here's the so. answer. That'd be pretty cool. Can I offset gains from rents with depreciation? Uh, the answer is, you go for it. Well, yeah, you can. Uh, your income, I won't, I'm not going to call it gains, but your income, your rental income is going to be offset by all of your expenses from your rental property, including depreciation. Yeah, so a lot of people don't realize depreciation is a deduction. So it's a tax deduction. So if you start looking at everything, you always look and you say, all right, income adjustments, deductions, credits. Yep. And you start looking and you say, uh, income, there can be exclusions from income. So like if I get reimbursed by an employer, I exclude that. I don't have to report it. Now I have income. Are there adjustments that I can take against that income? And then are there deductions that I can take? And then are there uh, credits that I can apply towards my taxes? Um, way funnier than Clint. They like you way better than Clint, by the way. <laughs> Um, we'd have them in here, but the ceilings aren't high enough to fit his head. That's horrible. Who yeah, says that? I never heard that. Yeah, no, no, Clint's awesome. He's been my partner for 20 some years. Um, he's been, a, he's a great guy. He's yeah. really funny when you watch him on stage too. Yeah. The only issue with this is, um, if you're not a real estate professional, you're, you're, de how much you can actually deduct on your return may be limited. So here's an yeah, easy rule. So if you make active income, and you have uh, then there's two there, there's active income there's capital there's portfolio there's all this fun stuff. What we look at is what type of losses do we have? Do we have ordinary losses, active losses? Do we have capital losses from the sale of capital assets? Do we have um, passive losses from things you don't materially participate in? <laughs> and real estate is considered passive right. per se. So if it's investment property. So if you have depreciation, it can't offset your other types of income unless you fall underneath one of the exclusions. And we were talking about one of the exclusions earlier, which is, again, 469C7, 26 USC 469C7. You go there and you look at it, and it's going to say, here's the exclusion. And this, you, you have to jump through the hoops. It's 750 hours for one spouse uh, with it being more than 50% of your personal services. And you have to materially participate. You hit those, you get to take... If you have depreciation that creates a $100,000 loss, you get to offset your W-2 income with it. So it becomes pretty, uh, uh, somebody that says, can depreciation offset W-2 income for an Airbnb business on a Schedule C? So that's a great, great question. And the answer would be pretty much kind of a yes, because you get your depreciation and you're an active participant. But I believe your real estate is going to be sitting on your Schedule E under those circumstances. You're going to grab the depreciation and you're going to use it on Schedule C. And I could see somebody putting it on there. I'm just not sure whether you get to put it on your Schedule C or whether it's sitting on your Schedule yeah. E. Yeah, I mean, even with the short-term rentals, I'm not sure that you're providing yeah. substantial services. Our in-house belief is that, oh, yeah, that's right. You have to do the substantial services. Right. Then you get ordinary loss, which means you got to do a lot more than just be an Airbnb. you got to start looking more like a hotel. Yep. Otherwise, you're not getting it. Yeah, so the Airbnb, the way we suggest people do it is they have a corporation that is the host and you rent your property to the host so that you're getting rental income, passive income with the depreciation. You're trying to get that thing as close to zero as possible and then you're trying to offset and write off everything else on your, on your, uh, on your corporation. I would not put it on a Schedule C. 
simply because your audit rate uh, as of uh, 2018, $100,000 a year business, the audit rate was 1,200% higher for a C, uh, for Schedule C versus an S-Corp, and about 800% higher uh, for the Schedule C versus a C-Corp. So um, anyway, so let us see what else we got. Are we getting close? Can I believe? Jeez, we still got a bunch of questions. All right? Can I can I expense travel to a remote? real estate investment owned by my qualified plan in order to supervise renovation? Um, the answer is kind of weird. Um, realistically, if you're the trustee, so your company is the sponsor of the 401k and it has an investment, then technically that could possibly fall underneath an administrative expense. But man, you got to be careful that you're not getting any personal benefit out of that thing. So I believe there's an argument that you could but I ran this by a, a few other people just, you know, that were in that industry, and nobody knew the rule, by the way. It was kind of funny. Uh, but they, but they kind of said, hey, this is like when you have soft costs in a mutual fund. You have expenses that you're personally benefiting. Uh, it's like you want to make sure that, it, that, that you're not possibly walking into that gray area. That being said, Exempt organizations have about 800 agents nationwide, and there are quite literally uh, billions of exempt organizations. So the chances of you getting a, a really thorough review or slim, I would just say, hey, uh, what you can always do is expense something through your company if there's a profit motive. And I would just say, hey, as a trustee, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. I'm looking at an area, but I'm also looking at the... Uh, the plan. I don't think I would use plan assets to reimburse that uh, yeah. company. And frankly, I wouldn't want to. I, I want to get more money into my plan than anything else. I think I would just expense it through my company and I wouldn't tie it to the plan. And, and, the, and the whole problem with this is there's really two different issues here. Uh, one is, as, as Toby said, you cannot benefit from plan ass assets. You cannot personally benefit. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other issue is that the plan cannot benefit from your work if you're a participant within mm -hmm. within that 401k or IRA or so forth. Yep. Um, so it's again, we I, I was not sure which way to go with this one. I'd just be careful. I would just run it through the company and I wouldn't specify it as having anything to do with the plan. Make it easy. I would make sure that if I did this, that all of my travel was only for. Yeah, if you're going out to a, a property and the plan is paying for it, that's the big thing. The answer is, can I expense travel? Yes. But do I want my uh, qualified plan to, to reimburse me for it? Probably not. Yeah. So, uh, can you have one corporation flick to active income back into passive for multiple properties? Uh, I'm not quite following that Where yes that one there's one that says can you have one corporation to flip active income back into a passive for multiple properties i'm not really following that one no. you're, you're flipping your active and generally the character of the income doesn't change just because you change entity types uh can i create an s corp late in the year and run all of my income expenses from an airbnb business through it for the year no. no. Yeah, you'd start once it's incorporated, once you get that business going. You can grab some of the expenses sometimes, startup expenses. So like if you were doing this and you were just you were out some money, you could lump it onto the onto the corp if you wanted to. Uh, can a small newly set up LLC buy a property? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Just because it's new, there's no seasoning requirement. You know, that. When, I, when I first looked at this question, I was going to say, well, you have to have money. But no, actually, you don't. A, uh, yeah, you don't even have to have money. Hey, uh, Patty and uh, Susan, uh, whoever's out there, there's a question that we're going to have to get on a – somebody is putting in a customer service request here or a status request. If you can see it second down, I'm not going to call them out. Um can a small newly set up LLC buy a property? That's really cool. And we'll make sure it gets done. Um, hey, next week, I think it is. Is it next week or the week after? Maybe the week after that we're doing the TaxWise workshop. 
it's starting to blend. It's getting towards the end of the year where it's getting really, really active. So it's not too late. We got a we got a full house in house. We're still bringing people in on the live stream, but I think we're sold out internally. But you'd still get to do the live stream because we can do that per infinity. Um, you get a two for Tuesday. It's one hundred ninety seven dollars. You get the tax wise workshop plus access to all three. We did the what I'm doing in two weeks is going to be a year end. We're really going to be uh, yeah, really focusing in on uh, on doing year end planning, and then also it includes the bulletproof investor, which is uh, two tickets to a three day tax and asset protection workshop here in Vegas or anywhere in the country where we hold them. We're doing uh, early next year. I know we're doing San Diego, San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, Houston, Dallas. Uh, I think we did Chicago the recently, Boston recently. We're going we're going to continue to do them throughout the United States. Uh, you get Clint's book on tax and asset protection for real estate. You get immediately a three-part video series, and you get a strategy session. Uh, can somebody contact me about the twofer? Yeah. Uh, let's see. We'll have to have Patty or somebody reach out. We'll get it. How about Minnesota? Yeah, it would be fun to go out to uh, uh, Minneapolis, beautiful city. Uh, or someplace there. My mom's actually from St. Cloud. We used to fish on uh, Mille Lacs Lake and eat bugs, which didn't mean to do that. I still remember vividly as a kid running out in the backyard after one of my brothers yelling at him and getting a mouthful of whatever just hatched. And uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, Florida, we'll probably do something down there. Florida, where they have mosquitoes as large as bats. Happy holidays or happy Halloween. So we, we need to do Florida in the winter and we Minnesota should. in the summer. Actually, I love Orlando. We'll probably do something there. And I know, I know we're doing, uh, actually, uh, with all seriousness, Vera, we're doing, uh, I know that we are working with a big real estate group in Miami that we're going to be going down. I think it's in December that we're doing a, a, an event there. Uh, and I'm not hating. Uh, if you attend a live stream, can you ask questions? Yes. And we have uh, an accountant attorney uh, handling the chat. You could also, by the way, somebody asked if these things are recorded. They're recorded. If you're platinum, you have access to all of them. If you're not platinum, I think we saved a, a month's worth or at least a few of them where you can go back in and listen to them. Um, and what else do we have? So you can go through and listen to our podcast. There's a lot of cool stuff. My partners are really awesome on this. Carl's really awesome on this. Uh, Clint has fantastic interviews Michael does uh, you just listen to our podcast coffee with Carl who's one of our attorneys he's pretty funny um, look at that big waves lots of big waves I'm gonna be back in uh, in Hawaii in uh, in December working with uh, buddy mines on the board of the real estate board over there in uh, in Alaska but I know he's, he's we're doing a continuing education for a whole bunch of a uh, Realtors, all the Alaskans come into Maui. There's probably 150 of them. That'll be at the Sheridan Black Rock in early uh, early December to watch the uh, beautiful whales and do all that. If you ever feel like doing that and get some continuing education, you should uh, you should reach out and just just Google it. You'll find you'll find it. Jerry Royce is the guy's name. He's a fantastic, dude. Um, anyway, and then replays in your Platinum Portal and uh, follow us on social media. And uh, everybody here, you can send in. If it, anybody wants to get a hold of me, by the way, you can always shoot it at Tax Tuesday. They're all going to come to me. Uh, you guys rock. And visit us at Anderson Advisors. Do the free stuff. And do not eat too much candy. Uh, somebody says, come to the North Shore of Oahu. I would love the North Shore of Oahu. It's one of the few places where they don't have so much build out. And that's our buddy uh, Lane uh, is out there. Kawaioka, he's also. Oh, you're in Turtle Bay. You rock. I, you bet you uh, you guys have some big uh, big waves out there right now. Oh, my God. Yeah, I imagine you guys have some pretty big surf. So happy Halloween, everybody. Love you guys. Hope you guys are uh, are doing great. And uh, we'll see you in a, in a couple weeks. I think we'll be doing the tax. Actually, we're going to be doing the TaxWise workshop. We're going to bring you guys in uh, live to do this. Uh, you're gonna have to come down to tax uh, the TaxWise workshop, right, and we'll and we'll do this live as a live stream. It'll be a little different. It'll be a lot of fun though. Thanks, guys.